Does everybody know the story, The Emperor's New Clothes? It's a very well-known, well-known story, isn't it? Um, there's a number of different books you can buy um, with picture stories in it. And um, there's a video I found on YouTube that this is from. I've got the address at the top, um, which is a lovely little animated version. It goes for 12 minutes, so it was too long for me really to include in here. But I thought we'd just think about the story. It revolves around an emperor, of course. What do we know about the emperor? He's very vain. He's fond, of, he's fond of new clothes and he's fond of showing off his new clothes all the time. So he spends more time getting himself dressed and showing himself in public than, he, than worrying about um, you know, governing the country and that sort of thing. Um, now, of course, into the story come two men, two swindlers, who pretend to be weavers and they come into the country and say, we can produce this very, very fine clothing that no one ever has ever seen before and you would be the only person in the whole world to wear this fine clothing. So, of course, the, the emperor is very interested in this and he gives them a room and he gives them gold and he gives them silk to go and start spinning the cloth and creating these wonderful clothes. Oh, and so an important point. We said, uh, what have I forgotten? What's the important point that these men t said about the clothes? Do you remember? They said that only people who were intelligent and wise and worthy of their position could actually see the clothing. So the king then sends one of his courtiers to go and look at these men at work on their looms and of course they go into this room on these looms and they have nothing on the loom but the man is aware of this um, of, of this apparent quality of these so-called clothes and so as these men start describing the wonderful colors on the loom the man simply agrees because he doesn't want to be shown up to be um, you know dishonest or not worthy of his position and various of the members of the court go about this. And eventually the king comes in and he looks at the, the cloth on the, on, the, on the loom. And then eventually the men pretend to create this um, uh, outfit for the king to wear. And they fit it on the king. And the king decides to go and parade out in, the, in front of all the people wearing his new clothes. And in the process of that, what happens? Do you remember? In the process of that parade, everybody's absolutely silent and a child says, he's wearing nothing at all. Now, I just wanted to reflect on this story because it's something that I've been thinking about during the week. Many of these folk tales have a meaning behind them and we can access them in many ways by thinking about the correspondences of things. So, Clothes. What clothes represent? Swedenborg talks about clothes representing truths or ideas or, or concepts or opinions. And they are the things that clothe our attitudes, these, these ideas. They, they clothe our actions and they clothe us. And so this is what these clothes represent, ideas and opinions and concepts. Now if we think about the emperor who's fond of changing his clothes, he's always looking for some new idea to pursue, some new concept that, you know, he wants to be the leading, the innovative person. And that's really who all he's interested in is the innovation, not in actually the reality or the benefit or the usefulness of these ideas. The emperor like many of the rulers in the Bible, represents us. It represents what rules us, you see, and the most important thing in our lives. Can I go to the next slide, please? The two weavers, the swindlers. Now, when we talk in the Bible, when we have twos, we looked at this last week with the idea of marriage. Whenever there's a two, there's a pairing of things. And the pairing of things is either goodness and truth, because they go together, or it's evil and falsity. Now, what do you reckon it is in this case? Is it goodness and truth, or is it evil and falsity? 
evil and falsity because they're swindlers. They're out for, it, out for themselves. They're, they're trying to con these people. They're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Can I go on to the next one, please? The invisible wall, indeed. Um, the ministers and servants in this story, these are the ideas that we have in our mind. These are the things that we learn which serve us. These are the true concepts and true ideas that serve us. Now, one of the things about these servants that go in and look at this cloth is they can actually see there's no cloth there. They can actually see that. But because they've been told this principle that if you can't see it, it means that you're untrustworthy, they don't want to appear untrustworthy and so they say, oh, well, we can see the cloth and yes, the clothes are fine. And it's the way we can bend our, the things that we've been taught and the things that we learn to our own opinions and our own way of seeing the world if we wish to. And that's a power that we have. We can take the things that we learn and we can bend them to our own ends. And this is what's happened here in this little story. And I think the last one is the child. And the child in the word and here represents innocence. Now the interesting thing about the child in this story is the child is the one who has absolutely nothing to gain either way by saying that there are clothes there or there are not clothes there. There's no benefit for the child. And so the child is unencumbered by this relationship with the emperor. And the child is able to say, well, he's not wearing anything. It's, it's plain and simple and obvious. So it's, it's innocence and it's a love of truth for truth's sake that is represented by the child.